here we go. Thank you very much. <sighs> Hello and welcome to our brand new series. Oh God, Gone Feral. Feral. What are you doing? Oh, I thought it sounded cool. No, 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 no. Just, just let me say it. Right. Okay. 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 Just smile at the camera. Hello and welcome to our brand new series of Gone Feral. What the? Yes, we're back. And this time, we've been even further afield in search of wildlife and adventure. Yeah, that's right. And this week, we have a rather special film to share with you. It's a film we shot back in summer when we decided it was about time we went looking for something quite unique. Right, that big floppy banana is a kayak. Well, it will be when Harry puts some effort in. And we've got it because we're going to head out there to hunt down and to try and photograph one of the UK's most elusive, secretive, almost mythical animals. Harry and I are up in Bonnie, Scotland, at an infamous lock where a seldom seen creature resides. Some people are doubtful that this creature even exists here, but some of the locals claim they've seen it, although that might be just to bring in us tourists. And the creature I'm on about, obviously, is the wallaby. So we inflated our floppy banana and donned our finest aquatic adventuring gear. One defense mode, one attack mode. And then tackled the delicate subject of ballast. Obviously Harry's going to have to go in the back. You want me to go in the back? Yeah. What are you trying to say? You're trying to say I'm heavy, I mean. And then we set off to find some wallabies. Why are you laying in the seat? You need to, the seat. You need to sit in the seat. This was our first time paddling together as a couple, but being true professional adventurers, it was no issue. Where did you, I was giving you perfect timing. Right. No, it doesn't work. Left, right, right. your other right, let's right. I was dead in sync. I was dead in sync. We're pointing back where we came from. Oh. We're meant to be going over there. We continued to spin our way across the lock towards one of the islands where we hoped to find the wallabies. Now the reason the wallabies are on the island is thanks to one lady, Fiona Gore, who's later known as Lady Aaron Cahoon. And she was a real character, a proper eccentric. In 1980, she broke the world record in a powerboat for being the fastest woman on water when she went over 100 miles an hour on Lake Windermere down in Cumbria. <laughs> But as well as loving powerboat racing and going quickly, she also had a real love for animals and had a menagerie with llamas, pigs and wallabies. And after World War II, she decided to bring the wallabies with her to her holiday home on that island. And they've remained there feral ever since. The expat wallabies on the island are bennets or red-necked wallabies and are distinguished by the reddish tinge across their shoulders, black noses and paws, and grizzled grey coats. We were distinguishable on the lock by our spinning, bickering, and general incompetence. Hey, you stop filming. Can you Eventually, though, we made it to the island to meet the crew, who cheated and hired a boat taxi to get there. We're arriving on Wallaby Island. Here we go. Careful. Oh, nice. Wallaby Island. Isn't that amazing? There's wallabies. In there somewhere, hiding. Hey. That's so cool. What's Ed! Yeah? Wrong island! No, we'll, we'll walk around! It's a different island! What? You're on a different island! Oh. Wait, we're on the wrong island. Idiots. Okay. Yeah, good job. Oh, nice landing. Okay. Once we elegantly landed on the right island, Edge began the important process of complaining. Well, that would have been a lot easier if someone hadn't forgotten the rudder. So we're spinning in circles and then oriented to the wrong bloody island. And then we got on with something actually useful and made camp. Once Bear Grylls had built his stupid old fashioned tent, I revealed mine which would be ready in literally two seconds. What on earth is that? Watch this. I 
Hope it blows away. <laughs> and after those two seconds, it was time to boot up and head out. As we headed out to search for the wallabies, we were gobsmacked by just how beautiful this island is. The ancient lock carved out by glaciers during the last ice age over 10,000 years ago protects the island from the heavier foot traffic and noise pollution of the mainland. The majority of the island itself is blanketed by a thick duvet of mixed woodland. Some dappled light does manage to break through the foliage though, helped by gaps in the canopy where older trees have taken a tumble. This light is just enough to carpet areas of the island with fabulous and rather funky mosses like this common hair cap, and ferns stand tall and proud, perfect for hiding wallabies in. The only signs of human activity, other than us, were Lady Aaron's old holiday home and boathouse. Right, enough of that. Let's find some wallabies. Wallabies are crepuscular, which means they're most active at dawn and dusk. So if they are here and they're out, this time of day will be our best chance to see them. Oh. The island's a lot bigger than we initially thought. So we're going to keep exploring and then maybe we'll find one of our little marsupial friends. The island covers an area of roughly 35 hectares, or in natural history documentary units, about 65 football fields. So, although the wallabies can't leave the island, they can certainly hide from us on it. Harry's tracking methods, which seemed to mainly involve asking stupid questions, weren't helping either. If you were a wallaby, where would you hide? Australia. Australia. Anyway, as the evening started to draw in, we began finding some tasty evidence. So I'm absolutely certain that these droppings belong to a wallaby. And we kept finding more. Ah, oh, more wallaby poo. Oh, yeah. You think it's fresh? <laughs> oh, guess what? The evidence was definitely fresh, which meant we must be close. Then Harry spotted some movements on the hillside. And on further inspection, Oh, did you see that's one of it? Bingo. It was definitely a wallaby. Definitely a wallaby. Unmistakable. It's just amazing to think that this unassuming island really does have wallabies. And our second encounter was sooner than expected. Oh my god. We've walked about five meters since we saw the first one. Look, look, look. And then I gave my camera it's a wallaby. Oh, look. They exist. Oh, it's hopping off. There we go. There it goes. See the length of that tail? It's incredible. There are actual wallabies on this island. We've got photos of <laughs> Yes! With wallabies sighted, it was go time. We'd come here to get photographs, and a couple of distant glimpses wouldn't cut it. We had to try and get closer. Which happened rather suddenly. Turns out the wallabies hadn't moved that far at all. Welcome to Conferral. 
Thrilled that we'd found them, we took a few moments to just appreciate how wonderful these creatures are. Red-necked wallabies are marsupials, which means they're younger born prior to being fully developed. And the female wallabies have a pouch on their belly, where the young continue their development after being born. Their hopping method of locomotion is thanks to their characteristically hefty legs that thrust them along, whilst a long, strong tail helps them keep balance. As a result, their forearms are used far less for manoeuvring and instead are used more like our hands for grabbing and interacting with things. Grasses, leaves and herbs are the preferred foods of this herbivore, and that's why they have long faces, like deer, to leave plenty of jaw room for the large, flat teeth needed to chew the vegetation. The wallabies are native to the eastern, more temperate parts of Australia and Tasmania, which is not too dissimilar to southern Scotland so they seem to be living a very comfortable, secluded life here on the island. We were also having a terrific time on the island, even though the wallabies decided to bugger off into the undergrowth. It didn't matter though, just being able to see them, let alone photograph them, had been an utter privilege. Have a look at this, look at this. I never thought I'd be getting a shot like that in Scotland. Bloody brilliant. <laughs> we carried on searching, but no more wallabies appeared as we lost the light. So we headed back to camp. I think we're going to leave it there for today. Yep, the light's going. We're quite tired out, so we'll have a bite to eat and we'll try again in the morning. Oh, nice work, man. Yeah, well done. So we had a quick bath to freshen up, cooked up some grub to replenish our energy, and made sure we were hydrated before going to sleep. First thing in the morning, we headed out again, determined to find more wallabies. With limited time on the island, it was important to remain focused and to not get distracted, say, for example, by a family of mallards or something. In our defense, they were bloody adorable, even getting too close for photos at times. The fellas move back a little bit. Back a little bit. Oh, that's cool. I'm gonna get up, I think, because my belly is quite wet. <laughs> so, although the, the background was a bit overexposed, those ducklings just came in so close. Look at the lovely, soft, downy feathers. Absolutely adorable. Let's see. Rubbish. <laughs> With our wallaby spotting skills honed in from yesterday, we managed to spot one surprisingly quickly. Wallaby! Yes, he's in the gap, in the gap. Oh, nice. Can you see him? It's just down there. Where is it? And it's cameraman Tom one. also managed to spot it. Uh, eventually. We head around that way. Wallaby in sight, we made a plan to loop round to approach it, to avoid disturbing it. We might be with a chance. Come on, let's go, let's go. That means go, go on. After yesterday, it took us about three or four hours to get our first sighting of a wallaby, so I wasn't expecting an awful lot this morning, but Harry. we've already seen it. Come on, let's go. So exciting. On our way though, Harry insisted on pointing at some dirt. I'm definitely no wallaby expert, but I can see lots of these little, these little holes in the ground. They're similar to the snuffle pits of a badger, 
where they're just sort of digging up little parts of the ground to see if there's any food beneath. Once Harry was finished tracking wallabies that we'd already found, we continued on our mission. Just see him through there. That's so cool how they move. It's like nothing else in the UK. Such a distinctive marsupial pop. So cool. One problem with moving slowly in summer, in Scotland, is that you very quickly become the epicentre of a midge festival. But it was undeniably worth it. Come on, go. There he is. Oh, you're absolutely eating alive by these myths. They're so good. That's the best encounter yet as well. I think we're going to have to move because, yeah, it's starting to hurt. <laughs> and then, just like yesterday, it turns out the wallaby hadn't moved more than a few metres. I didn't think he'd be right here. He's just sat in the ferns looking at us. <laughs> Holly gave us some nice opportunities for tight portraits before she bumbled off into the bracken. Once we spotted her again, we ditched our bags and got into position. I decided to go the long way round, whereas Harry went for the more direct route. Every now and then, I have to pull out this exceptional technique. It's called a bum shuffle. Amazingly, Harry's method seemed to actually work. Even though I copied Harry's technique, my longer route had cost me the opportunity. I've gone, I think. Never mind. <sighs> well, those last few wallabies we spotted have just bounded down into the undergrowth. I think they're going to get some rest, and I think it's about time we got off this island. What an experience though. As we disembarked Wallaby Island and set off across the lock, I reflected on some thoughts I'd had about how Lady Aaron's eccentricity would be preserved here. This is or was Lady Aaron's holiday home built in the 1920s. Now nature is starting to break through, sure, but the geometry, the strong edges and square angles remain resolute as undeniable signatures of a man-made dwelling. However, when the structure itself, when the strong timber beams that support the roof begin to crumble, it'll be harder and harder to tell that anything man-made was ever here. However, as long as the Earth continues to orbit the sun on its axes, we'll continue to get our annual seasons, and the vegetation here will continue to thrive. And as long as that continues to thrive, so should the population of feral wallabies that Lady Aaron brought here. So, the wallabies, the charming little population of marsupials, could be Lady Aaron Cahoon's longest surviving legacy on the island, unlike this also charming, albeit degrading, holiday home. Finding wallabies had been unforgettable, but managing to also get some photos made the whole experience even better. I like this one because the sea of ferns adds some great depth to the image. 
With this one, I also made the most of the ferns, instead using them to frame the wallaby. I reckon it was worth getting distracted by the ducks, and I hope to capture the bond in this image between the mother and her duckling. This whole body image really lets you appreciate its signature red neck and iconic marsupial shape. And this final image captures a nice bit of behaviour of a relaxed wallaby having a clean in the sunlight. That was so much fun. Absolutely brilliant. Except spinning across the lock because someone forgot let, the rudder. Honestly, like, you need to let it go. You have one thing. Let, let it go. I would have They're not the only population in the UK, are they? The no, 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 not at all. There's some off Northern Ireland. There's some on the Isle of Man. There are actually some in the Peak District that I went looking for, but no signs at all, so those might have died out. I think it's worth mentioning as well that they are clearly non-native, and the ones we saw on the island, they're quite self-contained. It's not like they're trying to swim off and get to the mainland. They don't need to. There's plenty of food there for them. But we don't know the long-term impact on the ecosystems that they have. So they could be damaging, which is why it's absolutely not worth experimenting and putting them into the broader wilderness, because it could have severe knock-on consequences. Next week, Harry goes shopping what exactly is this? It's Tim Tagus. And Ed gets papped. See you then. See you then. <laughs>